And I'm Mr. Shoes. And today we're back with another hiker grab bag. Ah, shoes. start with. They don't call me Mr. Shoes for nothing. We're not going to talk about specific brands of shoes because we want our videos to have a life to them beyond what's available this year. But we're going to talk to you about styles of shoes and what we learned about what worked for us on the trail. These shoes are the shoes that I trained in. I have a particularly big problem with my feet being really wide. These are New Balance Special Order G-Width. He's a hobbit. <laughs> this shoe is a non-waterproof mid-ankle, mid-height boot. It has reinforced bits on the toe box and the heel. It has a suede and synthetic make to it. Now, we trained from November till April. April. Uh, when we left. <laughs> Five days a week, with a big 20 mile hike every week, and as you can see, there's a bit of tearing and you can see some of the padding in the shoe there. That's something you want to look out for when picking a shoe to hike in, because you are going to be hiking up mountains and over rocky terrain, and if your boot's falling apart on you, then you're going to be up creek without a paddle. Up the creek without a boot. <laughs> These. New balances were particularly good for Canal Canuck not only because of the special width that they had, it has a nice shock absorbing foam here and we did most of our training in London, England which is city terrain, did really well with that hard surface and that impact that was coming back from concrete. The tread's really nice as well. We couldn't find another pair of these for his hike but we also decided that we wanted to go with something a little higher to start with and something that was waterproof. Those were a good training shoe for him but we did not bring that on the trail. Another style of boot which I'm impartial to is the full leather high ankle traditional hiking boot. It's got your heavy lugged Vibram sole, it's got gusseted eyelets and this is kind of what you think of when you're young and you're thinking of a German mountaineer on the Matterhorn. This is the kind of boot that comes to mind. It's also the boot that I grew up hiking with and when it came to hiking the Appalachian Trail this is a style of boot that I had in mind. However, a lot of the discussion online was to go with trainers or what are they called? Trail runners. Or trail runners. So I kept these in the cupboard. I went on a search through all the shoes that were available. Trail runners are essentially sneakers. They have very thin soles permeable thin mesh uppers and very low cut tops. Some companies go a bit overboard with their trail runner. Side by side you can see that automatically this one has a thicker sole, a bit higher top, but I don't know if you can see that, but there are lots of little holes and dots in the mesh upper. Now a big selling point for trail runners is that they're light and they're breathable. Trail runners are essentially sneakers. They have thin soles, mesh uppers, and low cut tops. Now, a big selling point for trail runners is that they're light and they're breathable. This means that a lot of water is going to be getting through the mesh of the shoe. And, that, and because they're low topped, a lot of mud and sticks and rocks will be getting in the shoe, making your life hell. The fact that the sole is so thin on the trail you're going to feel every little rock and bump in every step you take. On the second half of our walk, I did mine in low, to in low top shoes with thin soles like this. After a week, I had to change because every little pebble and every little stream and every rock we climbed, I could just feel it. And it made my feet so sore that at the end of the day, it was just awful. 
You can get trail runners with Gore-Tex or some sort of proprietary waterproof membrane like this shoe. You can have a non-waterproof trail runner like this. A lot of people who promote trail runners as a primary shoe for the Appalachian Trail will opt not to have a waterproof membrane with the argument that the mesh is going to dry out quicker than one with a waterproof membrane. And that's true. However, we're not talking about a shoe that's ever going to be dry. In our experience, we were never dry. So it wasn't an issue of things drying out and being comfortable and dry. It was an issue of being warm and comfortable while wet. We opted for shoes that were waterproof. You have that option if you want to go the trail runner route. The trail runner is now one of the most popular options as they say one pound on your feet is equal to five pounds on your back. However, we did not go with a trail runner on our hikes. We opted to have shoes that had more support. Which brings us back to these, which is a big heavy boot. Now you can see this one has a much higher top than this one, meaning it will give a lot more ankle support. However, after doing the research on the lightweight trail runner, we wanted to find something in between. Which brings us to a boot that is kind of a mid-weight light hiker. Generally, it's going to be a leather or suede. It's going to have some of the benefits of the heavier boot. It's going to have some of the benefits of the lightweight trail runner. You're going to make compromises. This was a style of shoe that seemed to work best for us. It's Gore-Tex lined, mid-height, a little higher than mid-height. It has reinforcements around the heel, and it has a reinforced toe box. This particular brand is wide enough to work with Canal Canuts wide feet and it worked very well for us. The support on this shoe is important as although we did a lot of training beforehand, our ankles were not used to the terrain we were walking on and thus I sprained my ankle lots of times in the first couple weeks. However, as I moved up the trail my ankles did get stronger so further up I moved to a waterproof version of this mid top. Companies are taking cues from what's popular in the discussions online and they're making these hybrid shoes that have all the benefits of a trail runner but have the high tops and the high sides support of a heavier boot. We've tried this one and a lot of the discussion online is finding that shoes like this are good for approach trails to rock climbing events and they're not really good for long distance hikes. Since you're walking so long, you might find that shoes like this are good for you and you just need to replace them more frequently. What you want to do is find a shoe that works for you. Whatever shoe you find that fits your needs, you want to make sure you prepare them for the trail. Now what we did to do this was when we finally found the shoe that we wanted after hours of searching, was hours, <laughs> weeks, we wore them around the house whenever we were inside. So weekends, if we were just lounging around, we'd be in our boots. If we're upstairs doing homework, in our boots. We were cleaning the dishes in our boots. We also wore our boots on our training hikes. So it got used to the shape of our foot and what it would be like when our feet swell and shrink and move around because that's a big part of what will be happening on the trail. Your feet aren't going to be the same size they are when you're just sitting around the shoe store trying them on. All of this will lead to you having a boot fit for the hike and a boot that is properly broken in. Once we found the shoe that worked for us, we purchased four pairs and we broke those in leading up to the weeks to our departure. We did not rely on resupply boxes at mail drops for our resupplies. We went into town and shopped at the shops that were available. However, we did have pre-addressed boxes with our boots ready to go when we needed to replace them. Some companies are really good at standing behind their product and will happily send you a replacement if your boot does in fact break down while other companies strongly suggest that you do not use their shoe for long distance hiking and will not send you a replacement along the trail. If that's important to you, do your research while you're looking for the shoe that's right for you. There were many instances where we were breaking in our shoes and on the phone with representatives from the company of the shoe we were wearing and they said, don't wear our shoes on the Appalachian Trail. I have a lot of respect for companies that are honest with you about their products. If you find a shoe that works for you and you want to make sure that your investment is sound, give the company a call, see what their replacement policy is. That will help you make a sound decision. Some of these shoes can cost upwards of $200 American. So you want to make sure that your money is going to something that's going to be a benefit to you on the trail and not a detriment. Hiking shoes are not the only shoes you have to worry about on the trail. 
After a long day of hiking, when you're trying to settle down, you want to be as comfortable as possible. One way to do this is to have camp shoes. Camp shoes are just comfortable shoes that you have in your pack so that after you've after your feet have carried you however many miles that day, you can treat them to a nice, soft, comfortable shoe. We found that Crocs were the best way to do this. Now, despite popular opinion, these shoes are a godsend. When I slipped my feet into my Crocs every night, I was the happiest boy on the planet. There are a lot of alternatives to Crocs for camp shoes, and you can spend a fortune on lightweight or super lightweight straps and flip-flops and space shoes or whatever the hell you want to buy. The Croc is cheap as chips and it's simple. The ones we have are hiking Crocs, which is ridiculous. It has a more robust sole and it has a strap along the back that is adjustable with Velcro. We didn't only use these for camp shoes, we also used these to ford rivers up in New England. And that was really helpful to keep our boots dry and not have to walk barefoot through the rocky streams and have a bit more sure footing. The Croc is, for our money, the best camp shoe. It's not the lightest. It's not the most glamorous. It gets a lot of guff. But for our money, the Croc was the best camp shoe that we could recommend. Now, for however much praising we give the Croc, you even though you're not going to be walking all day in these shoes, you really want to make sure you have a nice durable shoe to wear. If nothing else, you have to remember your feet are what is going to carry you to Maine. So making sure your feet can do their job properly is one of your top priorities. If that means investing a little extra in a shoe that's right for you, then go ahead and do that. Please make sure your shoes are broken in. Our buddy Totem at Neil's Gap was convinced that he needed to buy new shoes. He bought new shoes and after walking in them for a couple days he started to get blisters and sores and to try and combat this he bought another pair of new shoes <laughs> which again brought blisters and sores and he had foot troubles all the way up the trail going through eight pairs of shoes ditching the broken in pair that he had from the start which were doing him good. The only reason he changed was because someone told him these were a little better. Pick a shoe, break it in, and stick with it. One of the other arguments for trail runners is that there's little to no break-in period or break-in time for your shoes in order for them to be trail ready. That's not necessarily true. If you've done any sort of long distance running or middle distance running or fun runs or 10Ks or 5Ks, you'll know that you have to break in a pair of running shoes just like you have to break in a pair of trail shoes. So don't commit to a new pair of shoes on the trail unless circumstances don't give you another option. So please remember, shoes are one of the most important pieces of gear you have on the trail. I'm Canal Canut. I'm Mr. Shoes. Everyone on the trail has their opinion. And this is ours. Oh, it ain't gonna rain no more, no more. It ain't gonna rain no more. But how in the world can the old folks